It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the ASUS CG32UQ. The OSD is controlled by two different methods. So the first is a conventional method, so to speak, and you've got three little buttons there, little hexagonal buttons, and a joystick at the top. The alternative method is to use this controller here. I prefer this, I think most users would prefer it, it's just very easy to use. And you can see it has a power button, source select, you've got your navigation there, enter, X, which is exit, and there are two shortcut keys which you can configure in the OSD. And there's also a volume control, so you can quickly control the volume of the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5mm jack if you're using that. If you just rotate the joystick, I know on some models that does something that has very short cuts attached to that, it doesn't do anything. If you press the first button, that's your first shortcut key. I'll go through that shortly. It's um, By default, it doesn't control the brightness. That's just what I've got it set to. If you press the second one down, that's your second shortcut key. And this doesn't uh, control the blue light filter by default. Again, that's something that I've set up. And the next button down is the power button. There's a power LED, which you can disable in the OSD if you prefer, but it glows white by default when the monitor is on and amber when the monitor enters the low power state. The startup time for this monitor, so when you press the power button, power on, power off, turn the monitor off. The startup time is rather long on this one, which is why I've turned it off, just to turn it on again to show you. I press the button, and it does take a long time to actually spring back to life. So you can see an ASUS logo, CG series logo. So you could probably make yourself a nice cup of tea or coffee or your, or your favourite hot beverage by the time it actually starts up. It's certainly a monitor you want to turn on ahead of time. Finally it started up. So as you can see I didn't time that but it was rather long. I did that in real time. I didn't skip out sections of the video. So I probably could have boiled a kettle in that time to be honest. Not the fastest startup time. It doesn't personally bother me because I don't ever turn my monitor on and need it on in a hurry. I'll do it ahead of time, but I know that could be a little bit annoying to some users. The main menu system has a very interesting visual design, very unusual. It's not uh, like any I've come across myself on monitors before. And of course, a key reason for that is visibility. It's a console gaming monitor, or at least it's marketed towards console gamers. And that means that you might want to be using this from across the room, which is again why you've got your remote as well. Nice visibility, quite easy to navigate through. So it's split into various different sections and also has a little bit of information towards the left side, such as the resolution you're currently running at, the game visual preset mode you're currently running, if HDR is on, the sound mode you're using for the speakers, what the RGB LED lighting feature is doing, if anything, and the input you're currently using. So first off, there's game visual, various different presets. I'm not going to spend too long going through these, and that's simply because I don't like them. I don't see much utility in them. And you can see as well that there's an animation when you go deeper into the menu, which looks quite nice. Although there's a little bit of a delay. I wouldn't say it's laggy, but it's not the most fluid menu to cycle through. Just a little bit of a delay because of the animations and how they've done it. But it does look visually quite nice. So the scenery mode, that makes things look rather oversaturated, overly bright. You can manually adjust various things in these different game visual modes. So you can adjust the brightness. It's just bright by default. Um, the saturation levels, you can adjust that. However, it actually uses a separate saturation filter. A lot of the game visual presets do this. It gives you a kind of boost in saturation and it's not a nice boost. It crushes your shade range, it pulls things close to the edge of the colour gamut, much as you would see to an even greater extent if you increase the saturation further with this little control. If you decrease it, it doesn't do what you might expect. It doesn't sort of just start reducing that to more natural levels for the saturation. You, you'll find that some shades just appear really bright and saturated still. So some of the oranges and reds, for example and other shades just look far too muted, so you can't really get the balance right. But not to worry, you can simply use a different preset, just not use this preset. 
So there are other options. Racing mode is the factory default. That's good. I really have no complaints about that. It gives you good flexibility as well. So I don't think anything's locked off on the OSD with this one, except the saturation control and skin tone. So, okay, so a few things are greyed out, but you can still control things like the brightness, the color temperature, so you can adjust the color channels and stuff like that. And you have all of the image controls as well, such as overdrive. Some things are, and on image, you can't adjust the sharpness, so that's greyed out. But on some of these, you can adjust the sharpness. Next is cinema mode, and that causes intense oversaturation, much like scenery mode, actually a bit worse. Over sharpens things. RTS RPG, that makes things look quite flooded, but some shades appear very saturated, kind of messes up your gamma. Again, you can't counteract that, so you'd have to go into a different setting. Next is FPS mode, quite similar to RTS RPG. Just upsets the image in various different ways. You can also see that there's an option to reset everything um, in this particular preset to the factory default. So that just resets this preset if you press enter again. So you have to be a bit careful with that because you might accidentally wipe your settings which you've just set up. There are ways to save your favorite sets of settings to various different profiles and I'll come on to that a little bit later. There's MOBA mode and that's quite an interesting one, actually. It uh, highlights certain colours. I don't play MOBA games myself, so I'm not sure what the point in this is. It's obviously very selective about the shades it'll show. Some very saturated primary colours there, and some other shades are just completely monochrome. So quite interesting. There must be a tactical reason for this. But speaking of tactical reasons, don't select any of these modes because you think it's going to improve your input lag. Doesn't doesn't have any effect on that. The modes are purely changing things in the OSD and doing a few other filter changes on top of that doesn't affect your input lag levels in a positive way. sRGB mode. This is really just a dimmer version of the factory defaults. It isn't an sRGB emulation setting. It uses the full native gamut of the monitor. It also blocks off access to a lot of settings, including brightness. So before I fall asleep, I'll go to user mode and you'll see it actually says game visual racing. That's because the racing and user modes are essentially the same thing, um, except that user actually gives you a little bit more control over various things. So you can see that the saturation and skin tone is not greyed out anymore. So you can control all the settings here. So next up, you've got blue light filter, much more exciting than the presets, at least I think so. Different levels, level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4. I like level 4, and that's because it's a good strong setting. And I use it in the evening for my own viewing comfort when I like to reduce my exposure to blue light, and that's because it affects sleep hormones, keeps your body in a very alert state, which isn't what you want when you're supposed to be relaxing and ready to go to bed. And some users just find it more relaxing in general to reduce the blue light emitted from the monitor. What I would say is you're naturally going to be exposed to a lot of blue light in the daytime and it's actually an important alertness signal for your body to keep it awake as well. Um, so it's debatable whether you should be reducing that other than in the evening or before bed, but I'm not really going to be discussing the ins and outs of that on this video. Level 4 I find useful. So it gives a warmer look to the image, gives a bit of a green tint to the image, but your eyes do adjust to this to a large extent and you kind of start to get quite used to it. And the reason for the green tint is because it doesn't reduce the green colour channel, or at least it doesn't significantly reduce it. And that is because that helps to maximise the contrast. If you reduce the green colour channel a lot, then you do reduce your static contrast as well, which is unattractive. Next is colour. That allows you to change things like the brightness, the contrast level. And as usual, it's just increments of one. You can change that how you want. The observant amongst you will now notice that saturation is greyed out and so is skin tone. And that's because if you enable the blue light filter, then you disable it. It puts you on the default racing mode, even if you weren't on that before. So I was on user mode before, but it's shunted me back onto the racing setting. So I have to switch back to user mode. And I appreciate this can get a little bit annoying, but if you're clever with your shortcut keys, you can make it a bit easier to activate and deactivate things and switch between modes if that's what you wish to do. But the racing mode is actually very usable. But as I mentioned before, it locks off a few settings which you do get 
under user mode, which I'd like to show you now. So saturation, this is the digital saturation enhancement. I really talked about that before in relation to the other presets, but if you increase this, it boosts your saturation by pulling things close to the edge of the gamut without expanding the gamut itself. And especially if you start to increase this a lot, things really look very cartoonish. Things don't look right at all. You have a huge reduction in shade variety, not attractive. If you reduce this, then things look less saturated. It doesn't take long for some shades to look undersaturated. Others remain fairly strongly saturated. So it can be difficult to maintain a good balance here if that's what you like to do. And it isn't equivalent to an sRGB emulation setting in terms of reducing saturation levels appropriately. But it is what it is. And monochrome, if you have it at zero or a very low level, so if you have a particular use for just black and white on your monitor, you can, can always do that. But I like to just leave things at the default of 50 for this. Next is color temp, color temperature. You can select cool, normal or warm. Cool, as you'd imagine, gives a cool tint to the image, high white point. Normal gives a more neutral white point, but it's still a bit cool looking. Warm is a little bit warm looking. And user mode allows you to manually adjust the red, green, and blue color channels. There are three different gamma settings, 1.8, 2.2, 2.5. Don't necessarily assume that these do correspond exactly to the stated values. I can't remember if they did on my unit. Um, the 2.2 was good, but I, I can't remember if 1.8 and 2.5 were exactly right. But either way, it does give you either a neutral gamma setting a lower gamma or a higher gamma, depending on your preferences and uses. But as you can see, there's quite a gap between 1.8 and 2.2, then another big jump up for 2.5. There's the skin tone setting. Natural, I would just use that. But if you want your skin tones to look a bit yellowish, so this really just focuses on your sort of pinkish and red shades, really. It gives them a bit of a yellow cast, reddish, gives a kind of more intense, slightly sunburnt look to skin tones. So it doesn't just affect skin tones. If you look at the little bit of the red car below where it says skin tone, you might see a subtle change when I select yellowish versus natural versus reddish. So it just changes how that looks. I think I've said enough about skin tone now. So moving on to something a little bit more interesting, image. Various different settings here. You've got your sharpness control. Zero is the neutral value, and it gives a good neutral sharpness, a good level. You can increase that further if you prefer a sharper look to the image. In increments of 10, all the way up to 100, which is supremely over-sharpened and looks really weird. There's OD, overdrive. Various different levels of overdrive, zero to five. As mentioned in the written review, I like level two. These are all explored in the review. Aspect control, that's greyed out unless you're using the monitor at a non-native resolution. You also have to have FreeSync disabled in the OSD, you have to have Adaptive Sync disabled. And then you can access the aspect control menu. So full one-to-one, -one, which is a one-to-one -one pixel mapping feature, the full will use an interpolation process to map the resolution to all pixels of the monitor, fill up the space very nicely. And there's also a little greyed out thing there, four by three, and that's only available if you're actually running a 4 by 3 resolution aspect ratio where it would make sense. Next you've got Vivid Pixel and that's another sharpness filter. So increasing that is another way to increase the sharpness. It does it to slightly different degrees to the original sharpness control, the main sharpness control. So it's just another way of doing that. Next, you've got ASCR, ASUS Smart Contrast Ratio. That's the dynamic contrast function of the monitor, and that's explored in the written review. Free sync, on or off, that enables or disables adaptive sync on the monitor. So it's not just specifically AMD free sync. It would also be if you wanted to use NVIDIA's G Sync compatible mode. Next is PBP settings, picture by picture settings. I've only got one source connected, so I can't really show you these. Or perhaps I can, but it's not going to be particularly interesting. So it has side by side two sources. So it doesn't support four way P by P or anything like that, just two sources. And you can have them top and bottom or side to side, depending on your preference. 
And you can see that there's a lot of black space and that's because it's maintaining the appropriate aspect ratio for the different sources. If you selected a different resolution or a different aspect ratio, you could use more or less of the screen. PBP source, picture by picture source, you can swap the sources around. Color settings, that allows you to assign a different game visual mode to each different source, if you so desire. Next is input select, which does exactly what it says, allows you to select the input used by the monitor. System setup, this is where things get a little bit more exciting. So there's an ambient lighting feature on this monitor. It features an array of 66 LEDs forming a perimeter at the rear of the monitor, some around the right side, some down the left, and some at the top. I'll show you the actual LEDs shortly, but what these do is they allow a nice configurable field of light around the monitor. So I've dimmed the lights and it'll be a bit clearer now, although we can't actually even see it in a bright room because it's a pretty strong lighting feature. So there's Halo Sync, and what that does is it mimics some of the shades contained on the content and puts them around the screen, and it does adjust at a fair pace rather quickly when the scene changes. I personally find this quite annoying and distracting, to be honest. It just looks like a flickering behind the monitor. It doesn't really do anything for me. Some users might like it, but particularly when I'm gaming, it's just kind of annoying, to be honest. And I'll show you a little scene in a game just to show you what it does. So here you can see how quickly it reacts to changes in the scene. It's mimicking various different colours contained on the... It's mimicking various different shades contained on the content. And honestly, I just find it annoyingly distracting. I don't particularly like the Halo Sync feature, although fortunately there are other things you can do with these LED lights. They're not just a waste of space. So if you have Halo Sync disabled, you can then enable Aura Sync if you'd like. And what this does is this allows you to use software, Aura Sync software, to control the LEDs. Unfortunately, I can't show you this because for some reason the ASUS software doesn't work on my system. Now, when I opened it up, I don't even have it installed anymore because it was really actually annoying me quite a bit. I couldn't open it up because it said something about uh, something like ASUS lighting feature could not start or something along those lines. I then googled the solution to the problem. I found that it's a common problem with this software, not just for this device, it's used for various other ASUS peripherals as well. There's a suggestion there that you can change things in the registry, delete certain things and change certain things. I did all of that, tried several times, spent over an hour doing it, and I couldn't get the software to work. It keep getting me the same error message, so unfortunately I can't show you that. There is an alternative software um, which is in beta currently, and that is Aura Creator. As it says here, no devices available. As far as I'm aware, no ASUS monitors are currently supported by this. As I said, it is a beta software, so I'm hoping they'll add support in the future. And you can see again, it says, please check if both the lighting service, but I don't know if that is the same thing that was causing the error before um, with the other software, the Aura Sync software, or whether it's just because the device isn't recognized on this one. But either way, hopefully you'll have better luck running the software. It allows you to configure various different effects with the lighting, different colors. The nice thing at least is even if you're not using the software and you do have to have the USB cable connected as well, USB upstream cable to the monitor to use this and to program the lighting. But if you aren't able to do that or don't want to do that, you can still use Aura RGB. And this allows you to select very strobing, breathing or static colors. There's also a color cycle and a rainbow. The rainbow effect's quite pretty. It's not really something I'd see of much practical use unless you're sort of just using it as ambient lighting when you're not really using the monitor because I think it can be a bit distracting, but maybe some people do like the effect. And you can see the field of light it produces around the screen is really very powerful, very visible. So it's a good lighting feature, a lot more practical than most. Most lighting features you'd actually have to go behind the monitor to see them do anything at all. There's Colour Cycle, which just gives you a more gradual rainbow effect, really. So it really changes all the LEDs at the same time, more or less. There are breathing patterns. You can choose a different colour to breathe. There's a strobing animation. 
as well. Again, you can change that to different colors. And there's static, which is my preferred one. And you can set that to green, blue, cyan, magenta, or yellow. There's also red at the top. So I didn't show you that before. I quite like the red uh, or the yellow, depending on my mood in the evenings. It's kind of a, a fairly relaxing color on the eyes. It doesn't bombard you with lots of blue light, but it is useful in the evening. It creates a nice strong field of light around the screen. You can see there's a kind of dead zone at the bottom. That's because the primitive LEDs are at the side and the top. There aren't any LEDs at the bottom, so it doesn't give you anything where your stand is or around the stand. But for most of the monitor, it does give you a nice field and acts as a bias light and that enhances the perceived contrast, really useful in dimmer lighting conditions. I also like to use the cyan one sometimes, just in the daytime actually, if it sort of gets a bit dimmer outside. I do like this and if you're sitting in a brighter room, you can still see this. It's quite powerful, as I mentioned, the, the field and the LED strength is good. I would have liked to have seen a bit more customization in the OSD. For example, being able to set to a warm white and a cool white, that might be nice. But I do like the cyan, I do like the red, I do like the yellow. Good utility from this. So I did say I'd show you the LEDs themselves. So you can see there's a perimeter of LEDs. There's the same on the other side and also at the top of the monitor. So that's how they work and they really are effective at lighting up the wall behind the monitor. I decided I might as well leave the feature enabled. It goes with the blues of the menu system quite nicely. I think it's quite pleasing to the eye. Game Plus next. There are various different features. There's an on-screen crosshair feature you can enable. So there's a red or a green dot. Very simple designs there. So red dot in the middle of the screen there. You can change that to green. If you want to get rid of any of these features, so you've enabled the feature and you just want to get rid of it, you just have to press the X on the remote or, or the exit button at the back of the monitor and it'll disappear. So it's very easy to get rid of that. So there's the green one as well. And there are various different designs. I apologize that I said there was only dots. I haven't actually been through these before. There's also a red crosshair design, green crosshair design, and an alternative crosshair design as well. So three different types and two different colors. There's an on-screen timer feature, so it'll count down from between 30 and 90 minutes, depending on what you select. So that goes into the top left there. Next is FPS counter. This can be a bit confusing because it's got two different settings there, counter and refresh rate. They both actually display the refresh rate. So if you've got adaptive sync enabled and it's within the variable refresh rate range of the display, it'll show you your frame rate there. So between 40 and 60 hertz, 40 and 60 frames a second, it'll show you that there. This setting has a little graph, sort of a bit of a history of your frame rates, whereas the other setting is just a refresh rate display or frame rate display without the little graph next to it. So that's the only difference between those two. So your counter there is a bit simpler, just says 60 FPS, monitors running at 60 Hertz. That's what it says. And there is a display alignment feature, which allows you to line up multiple monitors nicely. Next, there's sound. You can change the volume of the integrated speakers. You can mute them. You can change the sound source and that's greyed out, I believe, because I haven't got anything connected to the 3.5 millimeter jack. So that's not a valid source at the moment. And there's Audio Wizard, which allows you to change to one of the different presets for the audio. This is explored in the written review. It is worth mentioning again here, the speakers are very good. They're the best I've actually heard on a monitor before. I like Movie Mode, which I believe is the default. The others are a bit less bassy, but you can change them according to your preferences. Next, there's Eco Mode. All that does is it reduces the brightness from the factory defaults. Completely useless. You can just reduce the brightness yourself and actually the mode I had it on before, sorry, the brightness setting I was using was reduced compared to this eco mode and it's therefore more ecologically friendly anyway. With this set to on, you can't actually control the brightness or see what the brightness level is, but it is brighter than 15, which is what I was using myself. I suspect it could be a level of 50 or something like that, whereas the default is 90. Next, USB hub. 
and you can just say whether you want the USB ports to be on or off during standby. On during standby will increase your power consumption, but it will allow you to charge devices connected to them. And it'll increase your power consumption even if you're not using the ports, and that's why it's off by default, set to off during standby by default. Instant wake up. I showed you at the start of the video, which seems like a very long time ago now, um, I showed you how long it takes to actually start the monitor up. And that's with so-called instant wake up on. So I don't actually know what this does. I'll turn it off. Um, actually, I'm too scared to turn it off because I might never be able to complete the video. I, I'm not sure what this does. It wasn't what I call instant wake up. It was really quite slow wake up. And maybe if it's set to off, it's even slower. Or maybe my very early sort of pre-production sample has a little bug where it doesn't do what it's supposed to. CEC, that's an HDMI specific feature. You can Google what that does if you'd like. I'm not using HDMI, I'm using DisplayPort, so this doesn't actually apply. OSD setup, you can change the idle timeout period before the OSD will automatically disappear after the last button press between 10 and 120 seconds. DDC slash CI, part of the plug and play functionality of the monitor, and allows you to use software to control the OSD. You can change the language that the OSD is displayed in. There's a key lock feature which will make it harder for pesky family members, usually younger family members, to mess around with your settings when you don't want them to. Power indicator so you can enable or disable that light depending on your preferences. It doesn't really bother me so I just keep it on. You can lock the power key specifically so you can't just turn the monitor off so easily. And you can reset everything to the factory defaults. Next is shortcut, so that allows you to customize the shortcut keys, one and two. So as you could see, I'd already set one to blue light filter and the other to brightness. That was my preference. You can see that there, brightness for shortcut key one, blue light filter for shortcut key two. There's various other settings you can set them to if you prefer. So you might frequently use Game Plus, for example, or My Favorites, which I'll come on to shortly if you like to load different settings very quickly. My favorite, that will store your favorite settings. It doesn't include absolutely everything. I'm not sure exactly what it does and doesn't include, but what I would say is the only thing I've noticed that it doesn't include is the blue light filter levels. It, that's just applied on top of everything else. So it ignores that, but it will store things like your brightness levels, your contrast, sharpness, preferences, OD, the overdrive settings, and also the RGB LED lighting, if you've got that set to a particular colour or flashing pattern, it'll remember that as well. So it is quite useful if you want to be able to store and recall various different sets of settings. And you can see there's four different options there. So that's really all there is to the OSD on-screen display menu system of the ASUS CG32UQ. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.